The following podcast is going to contain spoilers along with me, just a regular guy, talking about all the things I love, such as comics, movies, television, music, and books. So yeah, proceed at your own risk. Welcome to another episode of Just Another Fanboy. I'm your host, Steven, and today we're going to do something a little different. You see, when you produce a podcast that releases twice a week, there are going to be times when you run up against a deadline. An episode needs to come out. You don't have anything recorded, regardless of the fact that you've been doing a really good job trying to stay two to three weeks ahead. Sometimes life just comes at you and you don't have a choice and you got to throw something together and get it out there. But You don't want to just throw anything together. You want to put something out there that is a bit of quality, some quality work, something that people are going to enjoy. So what we're doing here is I'm dipping back into the well. I'm creating episodes in which I dip back, back, back in time, and I grab episodes from a previous podcast and represent them to you, my listeners. See, I do this other podcast called Stephen or Else. It doesn't come out all that often. I put a lot of work into it. It takes a lot to get an episode out. But originally, the show was called The Stephen or Else Podcast. And I did 30-some episodes, 37, 38, 39, something like that. I did a number of episodes before I decided to reboot it. And I took all those old episodes off of the Stephen or Else feed. Now, they are buried deep down at the bottom of the Everything or Else feed. But I thought I would republish them every once in a while when I run into an issue like I have today, where I'm coming up against a deadline. Now, these episodes tend to be anywhere from 45 minutes to an hour or more long. I am not going to present them to you in the way that they were originally presented. I'm going to try to edit them down a bit because I did tend to spend the first 15 to 20 minutes of certain episodes just taking care of business, talking about what's going on with the podcast, what I may be doing in the future, what else I'm doing with podcasting around the time. Stuff that doesn't have anything to do with the main subject of the episode. So I am going to try to pull those out whenever I can. And that's what you're getting today. So I'm not going to, I'm not going to beat around the bush any longer. Let's just get to it. I'm going to present to you featuring the music of Michael Kill used by permission, I might add. This is episode number 21 of the Stephen or Else podcast. This was released on January 13th, 2019. And it is entitled, Conan, the Frost Giant's Daughter. Between the years when the oceans drank Atlantis and the rise of the sons of Arius, there was an age undreamed of, when shining kingdoms lay spread across the world. Hither came Conan, the Cimmerian, sword in hand. It is I, his chronicler, who knows well his saga. Now, let me tell you of the days of high adventure. You're listening to the Stephen R. Else Podcast, episode number 21, Conan, the Frost Giant's Daughter and Other Stories. Welcome to another episode of the Stephen or Else podcast, the only show that thinks Crom is some kind of weird Sumerian cheese. I'm your host, Stephen, and this week I'm talking Conan, and that's Conan, not Conan, right? Is that up for debate? Some people call him Conan, some people call him Conan. When I think of Conan, I'm thinking of Conan O'Brien. So I'm going to try my best to call him Conan, though I know I sometimes slip into the Conan name. But that's what we're talking about this week, Conan, specifically the first Dark Horse trade from Kurt Busiek and Kerry Nord. And uh, so let's do that. Before we get into the book, however, let's, 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 uh, let's do a little history of Conan. So according to the great repository for all human knowledge, 
otherwise known as Wikipedia. The character of Conan was created by Robert E. Howard in 1932 in a series of fantasy stories published in Weird Tales magazine. Now, I didn't read. I've never read any Conan stuff. I know that eventually Robert Jordan, if you if you don't know who that is, he's the guy that wrote the Wheel of Time series, which will be coming to Amazon Prime at some point in TV show format. He uh, is also known for writing Conan stories after, you know, Robert E. Howard stopped. And we're, I don't know, we're talking 20 years ago, maybe 20, 30 years ago when Robert, when Robert Jordan did it. But uh, I've never, I've never read any of the Conan books. That's not how I was introduced to Conan was by the books. I, I, I know they're out there and I've known that they've been out, that they're out there for a long time. And I actually have probably three or four old beat up Conan paper books around the house somewhere. I need to go look for them because I'd love to read them. And the only reason I never have is because being the comic book guy that I am, I feel like I should read them in order, but I probably don't have to. Um, now, eventually, the character did come to Marvel Comics in, in the 70s. It was written by Rory Thomas, and there were actually two different books that Marvel did. There was Conan the Barbarian, and that ran from 1970 to 1993. It had a total of 275 issues, all written by Roy Thomas. Then they did this. They also did uh, the Savage Sword of Conan that ran from 74 to 95 for a total of 235 issues. Roy Thomas wrote those as well. Those were black and white and were in magazine format, meaning they weren't comic book size. They were magazine size. And the reason they did that is producing the book as a magazine. They didn't have to follow the Comics Code Authority so they could do all the kind of stuff that Conan would be doing that they couldn't do in the actual comic book because of the Comics Code Authority. Now, Dark Horse eventually picked up the property in 2004. They had it until 2016. The The, the book we're going to talk about is the first seven or so issues of those Dark Horse books. But eventually, uh, Conan has found its way back to Marvel. And the first issue of the new Conan books written by Jason Aaron came out this month. Now, for me, my history with Conan, I think I was kind of aware that Conan was out there. Uh, I knew as a kid that they were the comics, but I'd, I'd never read any of the Marvel comics. My first introduction to Conan was around 1984. The, the movie Conan the Destroyer had come out, and I probably saw it. I didn't go see it in the theater. I probably saw it on HBO. Um, or it could have been on uh, like TNT or something. I just remember, I don't think Conan the Destroyer was rated R. I think it was rated PG-13, whereas Conan the Barbarian, which came out in 82 and had James Earl Jones in it as the bad guy, that was rated R. And it, it, it was a number of years before I saw it uh, because, you know, I was just a little guy back then. And in 82, I would have been about 10 years old. Uh, so yeah, probably 12 or 13 by the time I saw Conan the Destroyer, but that movie was amazing to my little 12, 13 year old mind. I mean, we have Conan, who's this muscly dude. He's got this little partner with him and they're thieves. They are hired by this woman to go take this princess to, uh, get this horn, like a magical horn. And with them on their adventure is Grace Jones and Wilt Chamberlain. And... So they go on this quest, they find the horn, they bring the horn back, find out that the horn is there to bring uh, the avatar of this god to life, and then they're going to sacrifice the princess. And so they put the horn in this statue, which turns into a monster, and of course Conan gets to fight it, and he rips the horn off, and there's lots of blood, it's really cool. That was my first real experience with Conan. Like I said, I'm sure I'd seen the comics now and again, I may have even read one or two. I have no real memory of reading any Conan comics, to tell you the truth. I can tell you that Barry Windsor Smith was the artist on a number of them. You know, the Marvel comics. But uh, beyond that, no real idea. Um, now, again, eventually I did see Conan the Barbarian, uh, which I did not like as much as Conan the Destroyer. Uh, and then, of course, there was a... Uh, a Conan reboot a number a few years back, and I want to say Jason Momoa played Conan. I don't remember anything about that movie. I remember liking it, but beyond that, I don't remember much about it. But that's my that's my his that's my uh really my history with Conan. 
Eventually, when the Dark Horse books started coming out, I think I had read one or two of them. Um, but when I read this trade recently, it was apparent to me rel- relatively cl- quick that I didn't get that far. I think, um, I think I just read two. I didn't really get that far into it. Play back of my mind a million times See the same things, review the same lines It's cold, I just need to move around some words Perspective will change of a game The ground I lost at first Worst is yet to come, hear it in my head Lately in the morning, I don't really wanna get out of bed Instead of rather let it all fade away Let my friends all leave Better if they don't stay okay I guess you had a point when you said that I was probably wrong about feeling like I'm better off dead Sort of starting to wish I'd slip off to sleep Instead of walking around pretending like I still feel anything It's getting really old, wearing the same mask I remember my sense of humor so I still force myself to laugh My last thoughts for I finally started up the bad dreams I'm starting to doubt I'm even really trust me Is that you? Was that me? Lately it feels like it's a struggle for me to even bother to speak It's been a long week, it's been a long week It's been a long week, it's been a long week is that you? Was that me? Lately it feels like it's a struggle for me to even bother to speak It's been a long week, it's been a long week It's been a long week, it's been a long Life Okay, so Conan, the Frost Giant's daughter and other stories This was a trade paperback Published by Dark Horse Comics in 2005 It was written by Kurt Busick uh, The art was by Carrie Nord and Thomas Yeats Color art by Dave Stewart and the letters were by Richard Starkings and Comic Craft. This collected issues zero through six and 14 pages from issue number seven. Now, before we get into the story itself, I want to just mention the book was freaking beautiful. It was, it is a gorgeous looking book. The art, I mean, first of all, Dave Stewart is just an incredible colorist. He just, he knows how to color a freaking book. And that's an art form unto itself that I'm never going to understand. He was actually the one. Okay, so from what I understand, I remember at the time reading about the book and reading about the fact that when the art was done, they basically colored Carrie Nord's pencils. There was there was no real inking done. So typically in a comic book, you do pencils, you go over it with inks, and then you color it. But Dave Stewart, apparently, I just recently read that Dave Stewart was the one he was the guy that looking at Carrie Nord's pencils, he said, we just, we're, I, I want to just color it. I don't want, let's, let's not even do inks. Let's just color the pencils. And I have seen that done with other books and have not enjoyed it at all. I like a nice black line. I like some inks on a book. I think for certain books, um, you need that crisp black line separating the colors, but it freaking worked in this book. I mean, like I said, it is gorgeous. If you have not even just looked at any of these issues, you really need to, because it is a beautiful looking book. The, the, the story is also great. So that's, you know, you're, that's already, you're, you've got a, you've got a great looking book and you've got a great story. So that's an A plus book in my park. You know, I don't know what parks have to do with it. I, I don't know if I was trying to go for a sports reference there. Uh, but I did, and I failed. Anyway, I I think the only nitpick I would have with the book, and I remember when I read uh, the first issue or two back then, the narration. There are narration boxes that go along with it, narration boxes. And the typeset, the font used in those narration boxes look like typewriter letters, letters, you know, done from a typewriter. And I was actually turned off at first. With that, because it's, you know, in my mind, it's like, okay, we're reading a book about, you know, it's a sword and sorcery book. It's set in the past, a fictional past. There were no typewriters back then. Why are these text boxes, why does it look like I'm I'm reading a a yellowed page that has been typed? And eventually it kind of hit me, well, that's because, you know, it, I guess we're, I can only assume that the idea was that we are, they were wanting us to, uh, I guess, connect that with Robert E. Howard's books. Like we were reading 
his original drafts and then seeing it all come to life on the page. That's the only, that's the only possible um, outcome I could come up with in regard to that choice of font. And once that, once that hit me, I had no problem with it after that. So the first, the book opens up actually in, uh, in the future, it's still in the past, but it's Conan's future. And there is, I'm not going to, I'm not going to use a lot of the names from the books. Cause honestly, I couldn't, I'm not 100% how to pronounce them. And I've forgotten most of them as it is, but you've got this prince, uh, whose father apparently runs the biggest empire in the world. They are, they're the guys that now run things in the world. And I don't know if he's out collecting taxes or if they're just exploring some of the, the outlying areas, areas of their realm. But at some point they stumble across, uh, something that is, I think it's, I think it's supposed to be a tomb. And in investigating, they find this giant treasure room. But the one thing that really seems to pique the interest of this prince is this toppled statue and it's of Conan. And I know from my periphery of the world of Conan, and I think, I believe they mention it, I think it's at the end of both movies, that eventually Conan does become a king of, of some kingdom. And so this is a statue of Conan the king. And there's some, some writing on this, on the base of the statue. And the prince is just really interested in this Conan guy and he wants to know more about him. So these, this opening, uh, is from the zero issue and it's really kind of there to kind of set up, you know, what we're, what we're looking at. We are reading what these scholars and scribes and whatever that work for the prince, what they have gathered up about the stories of Conan. So I guess maybe that, I don't know. So that's what we're, that's what kind of leads into the main, uh, ongoing series starting with issue one. So with issue one, when we, when we get into the actual series, you've got Conan. He's, he's, he's a young man at this point. He may be in his, his early twenties and he's, he's come out of Samaria and he, uh, he stumbles across this village and these warriors that have attacked this village that's full of women and old men. And the, the race of people in the village, I think they were called Acer, A, A, E, S, I, R. And they, uh, Conan refers to him a few times as men of Asgard, even though the only God that I hear them, that I, that I remember them mentioning is Ymir, Y-M-I-R. I don't know, man. I don't know if that's a real Asgardian God. I've never run into the dude, uh, watching any of the Thor movies. I'll tell you that. But this other, uh, group of, of, I don't remember what they were called. They have a blood feud, the, 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 the Acer and these other, this other group, this other race of people. And the bad guys, we'll just call them bad guys, have attacked this village because their men are out hunting. And so Conan comes across this. He defends. He helps to defend the village. He kills a lot of these guys because that's what he does. That's what Conan does. And then the Aesir warriors come back. And uh, they also are bitter enemies of Sumeria. Apparently, nobody likes Sumeria. Nobody likes them at all. The Sumerians are not people that, that the rest of the world seem to like. But because Conan stepped in and helped these people, they become, they, they become friends. And so Conan with all the other warriors set out to go track down the, the, these, uh, warriors that attack the village. And, um, during this adventure, there's a battle in the snow. Everybody is killed except for Conan. He goes stumbling away where he encounters a very pale-skinned woman who's practically nude, dancing around in the snow. She draws him away, where he is then attacked by a pair of frost giants. He kills them both. And then I think, he, if I remember, he passes out. But eventually, the, 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 the Acer warriors um, from the village, they find him, and he tries to tell them what happened. But there's no... Uh, record. There's the, the giant, the dead giants are gone. The woman's gone. You know, was it true or not? But we do learn at some point that Conan, the reason he's left Sumeria is he, his grandfather, Sumerians apparently are not known for, for, for leaving their lands. They like to stick where they're at. But Conan's grandfather also left at one point and he came back and he would tell stories to Conan about these, the other people out there in the world. 
And the one that really stuck to Conan was a place called Hyperborea. And there were just these tales that his grandfather would tell of the immortal people that lived in Hyperborea and how it was a, an, a, an idyllic place, um, even though they were in the north, in the mountains, where it's cold and bitter all the time. In Hyperborea, it was warm and sunny. It just was just this wonderful place. And these immortal people, when they were, when they were tired of life, they would leap from the cliffs and the, these magic winds would take them to their gods. And Conan really wanted, Conan really wanted to go see this place. So he leaves Sumeria to go see Hyperborea. And that's when he runs into the village being attacked. And he becomes a group of, you know, becomes a part of this group of warriors. But there's a, there's one particular guy, Sjarl or something like that. Man, I, you know, I'm sorry. I didn't note down any of these names because they were all freaking weird. But when Conan first encounters this village, what, what he actually encounters is a woman and her baby. And this warrior is about to kill them. And Conan steps in and just, floop, just slices the dude's head, just cleaves it from his body. Just such a great, such a great panel. There's a couple of panels in the book where Conan just slices, just, you know, just chops a guy's head off with his sword. And just the way it's drawn, it's not like super gory and bloody. It's just this, it's just really awesome. Kerry Nord is just a great artist. But anyway, the woman that he saves, of course, she kind of, hey, you know, you're big strapping muscly man who saved my life. Uh, you now have my eye. But there's a guy in the village, one of the warriors, who kind of likes her. And so now he's all, he, you know, he's all upset. You know, not only has a Sumerian come and made friends with all these dudes, he's also might be making some time with his lady. So when they go out to track down the warriors that attack their village, this Sajarl, he, uh, he and another guy are plotting against Conan. And so they're out there and they're tracking down more of these warriors. And there's a, there's, there's the big final battle between, uh, Conan and his, his, his guys and the other, the other warriors when suddenly these giants and by giants, they're probably like 10, 12 feet high, but they're these big pale looking dudes. And at first I thought they were frost giants. They all come in and they start attacking and, uh, Conan and his boys, they can't, they can't fight him off. And so they make a deal with the other guys, you know, let's team up together, give us our weapons back and we'll fight alongside you because this is the bigger threat. So they all, they let him go. They get their weapons back. In the meantime, Sjarl, he and his buddy, they leave and, uh, they're, they were trying to, uh, lure Conan away at one point. They're saying, you know, after the battle, you know, we have to, we need to go. We'll, we'll go with you to Hyperborea. And you find out that uh, Sajarl has made a deal with some other group to bring Conan to them so they can capture him as a slave. Well, when these giants rush in, uh, Sajarl's up there on this rock with his buddy watching this happen. And he's like, oh, no, they're early. They decided not to wait. So these whoever these guys are, these are the guys that they made a deal with. Well, in the meantime, Conan's down there and he's he's let he's he's uh, with the, the leader of the other group. And the leader says, look. I know I have an idea of how to get us out of this. If you, if we can just take two or three people and get them around to the other side of this battle and put them on high ground, they can attack from that side and that will help us uh, defeat these guys. And Conan's like, I'm on it. And he, he takes off and he sees Sajarl and his buddy up on this rock. And that's the, and he's like, that's it. That's where we got to be. There's two guys, me, that's three. Let's do this. He climbs up on the rock and he's telling Sajarl the plan. And Sajarl's like, you know what? Nope. And kicks Conan away. And he ends up uh, getting beat up, right? Falls in, in, into unconsciousness and everything goes black. Challenge your audience to change the game a couple times. Flip the script to otherwise it is wasting the rhymes. 
I mean it's true, I got the level max out Running around, flipping out and all the end of that fool sound And maybe you wanna step up with some magic cards And maybe you wanna join me next week holding placards And maybe you think that you can see me in some Mario 3 Or maybe you wanna join me for book club feminist readings My politics a little past left Think I'm the only anarcho socialist and nerdcore Yes, but anyway, call me out whoever you can Man, between the rounds of Mortal Kombat I read it in my Goldman But not trying to be labeled an extremist Ask Jesse dangerously, I'm the one some future meanest Evolution is growth, seeking intelligence and sees it And you're left with a mind if I'm a negative three Challenge your audience and that's the job, no way to give it up or pass it on To last at all Challenge your audience Take these tunes so you can suffer obscurity and be real soon Straight true Challenge your audience Prime directive if you're trying to connect with peeps and find respect within the scene Challenge your audience and that's the job, no way to give it up or pass it on People don't really get upset on the internet whenever I post on my music page about political ideals, but I can't do things like, you know, make fun of the fact that Guile has the same tattoo on both arms. So when Conan wakes up, we learn that he's in Hyperborea. These large, giant men uh, are basically creatures uh, made through sorcery by the Hyperboreans, and that's who Sajaral had to deal with. And the Hyperboreans are immortals, and they do live an, an, an idyllic life, but they do that through the use of magic, and they do that through the use of slaves, and they send these giant warriors out to capture people and bring them back to be their slaves, and to also uh, add men to their army. So these, these giant warriors aren't, the, aren't their only soldiers. They have their own army. And Conan and his, his, the guys that he are with, they're put into this army. But they do it with the use of this, uh, this basically this chemical potion that clouds their minds. And uh, one of the slave women comes to Conan at one point and, uh, because he has been able to three times since he had been there, and he'd been there for a while now, I don't know, a few weeks or a month, three times during that time frame, he has such strength of will and strength of mind. He was able to fight through this potion or the smoke or however they use it to cloud their mind and come back to himself. So she, she, she sees this. She goes to him. She wants to escape and she gives him these leaves and says, if you chew on these leaves, if you do like three leaves a day, three times a day or whatever, then, uh, you will, the, the potion, stuff won't work on you anymore. And it was actually very reminiscent. I have to assume that I don't know which came first. Cause I know that during this run stuff like the frost giants daughter and other stories that are interwoven with the main story are actually adapted by Robert E. Howard's short stories. But this whole part here where Conan is captured, he is, uh, put under mind control. He's, he's being used at first for sport as a gladiator and then being trained as a warrior until a slave woman gives him these leaves that will help wake up his mind. That totally happened in like the first animated G.I. Joe cartoon movie where Duke is, is captured by Cobra and he has this headband put on him to turn him into a slave. And they have all these other slaves that have these headbands. And they're controlled through this electronic mind control. And he's forced to fight in a gladiator arena with another slave gladiator until a slave woman who wants to be free gives him this little gold strip of metal that he can slide into the, into the headband. So between his skin and the headband that will stop the mind control. So I have to assume that this part in the Conan story was adapted from one of Robert E. Howard's short stories, and then the people who wrote the G.I. Joe movie in the 80s just took it from that. Or it's just a big coincidence, because that crap happens all the time. So anyway, uh, there's this whole plan. He asks her for more of the leaf, because he wants to free all these other dudes with him to uh, help her escape. But they're, if, if, if they're going, they're all going. Now, what you learn at this point, though, is that these, these Hyperborean people, these immortals, when one of them decides that they are tired of life, you know, they have, they've lived for centuries. They realize that life, you know, really is boring 
and they're ready to just pack it all in. Then they go to this bridge that leads to nowhere that just ends, and they leap off into this chasm below. But every one of their slaves, all their warriors, everybody that is in their quote-unquote house, they also leap to their deaths. So there's like 20 or 30 people that leap into this chasm, and this the slave girl knows that eventually the 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 hyperborean lord that she is uh that whose house she is in is eventually going to want to do this she doesn't want to die so they come up with this plan and uh everything is is going just fine until the the lord that she is whose house she is in decides he's ready to to end his life so they have to escalate their plan and conan finds out you know he his warrior men his warriors they're all starting to wake up and then they all start fighting. They, they, you know, they start fighting their way out. Conan is supposed to meet her at this certain, at the, you know, at the end of the staircase. She's not there. He realizes that she had given him all the leaves that she used herself. And so she was back under the mind control. And in the end, he can't save any of them. They all leap to their death. He's the only one that survives. And it's only because um, he falls off of a wall into an alleyway and is struck unconscious. Nobody knows he's there. He's fighting like two guys. One of them he kills and he falls off of the wall. The other guy he kills and the guy falls on him and they both fall over the wall and they're all laying, the three of them are laying there in this alleyway. Nobody else knows that they're there. Conan's not dead. He wakes up and realizes that the this Hyperborean Lord and all of all of his people, which include all the warriors, the Acer warriors that were that he he was in a band with, a band, not a rock and roll band, they all jump to their death. So he uh, he climbs down this cliff face, down into this chasm, finds them all down there. There are these giant bugs that are eating them. Um, he fights them off. And the main dude, the like the lord of the village, the Acer village, his name, I think his name was Njord. He was still alive. He was just barely clinging to life. And he he begs Conan to build them a pyre because their people believe that the only way they can get into, they never call it Valhalla. I think they call it the eternal land. I don't remember. But the only way that they can get there is by is through fire. So when they're dead, they're, they're put on a pyre. And then the smoke rising into the sky is is their their souls being delivered to heaven, basically. And so Conan does that, and then Conan leaves, and now all he wants to do is find Sajarl and his buddy and end their life for everything that happened. And he tracks them to a village in Namedia or somewhere like that. Again, I can't remember a lot of these names. Finds them in this village, and man, he just, he's, he kills them both quickly, but very brutally and violently. It's not shown. You know, the, the book itself is not graphic, really. There's blood in it, but it's not over the top graphic. And, uh, but like one of the dudes, he's standing over him with his sword and he's going to stab him. And the guy's yelling, no, no. And he just stabs him right in the mouth and, you know, right through the back of the head, through his mouth. And, uh, that's how the book, you know, now he's, he's, uh, He's done what he set out to do. He was, he left Sumeria to go to Hyperborea. He ends up in Hyperborea, realizes it's not obviously what he was told it was. The two men that betrayed him and his friends to get him there, he, uh, tracks them down, exacts his revenge. And now he's, uh, he's done, but he's, he doesn't want to go back to Sumeria. He's, he's going to stay out and he's going to travel. And uh, I think that must be because the, you know, it said it collected books zero through six and then like the 14 pages from book seven. So I'm assuming the rest of issue seven is him setting out to to start his next adventure. And I'm hoping that trade two has those the rest of that issue. I would assume it would have to. So but yeah, so that was Frost Giant's daughter and other stories. A plus. I don't really do grades for books. But it was a heck of a lot of fun. I, it was, it was a lot of fun. It was beautiful. It was a great story. It was a real page turner. And I'm definitely going to keep reading the rest of these Dark Horse books. Cause I'm really looking forward to, uh, what's coming out from Marvel. 
I'm hearing really great things. There's going to be three different Conan series coming out from Marvel, one which just launched here in January, one that launches in February, and one that launches in March. And so far, what I've heard of this first book, this first issue, it's it's supposed to be really, really good. And I haven't read a lot from Jason Aaron, but everything that I've read from Jason Aaron, I've enjoyed. And he seems to, based on some of the stuff I've read, he seems to have a great love for the character. And it sounds like he's the right guy for the job. So uh, once that, once the first trade of those books are out, I'm definitely going to hopefully be able to pick that up through Hoopla uh, or they'll have a copy of it at the library because as you all know, say it with me, I'm a low rent fanboy. I got my tin full hat, I got my skill 12 inches, got my people behind me and beside me and within me, got a big stack of books and a slightly off filter grin, think I'm going away again. I got my tin full hat, got my skill 12 inches, got my people behind me and beside me and within me, got a big stack of books and a slightly off filter grin, think I'm going away again. Woke up again today, snowed in, it's a whiteout, got nothing better to do, so let's start the Psych out. I'm digging a big hole and throwing everybody in it And I wasn't in the game But you can go ahead and finish permafrost Permeate your perpetual ball state Be called a bad influence in a false case A real sore loser, real deep dude that can't maneuver Who you preach the truth for? Cause I don't know what it more The situation's eyesore, looking out for you Staring to the high beams, I see the future blues Spend all this time scared of the reds Only to realize that they just scared them ashes on the deathbed I don't know what I said it doesn't even really matter Leave me to my illusions You still got your disasters Think I'm going away again Think I'm going away again. I got my tenfold hack my I want to thank everybody for listening to the Stephen R. Else podcast Well there you go Conan, the Frost Giant's daughter Really good book Really enjoyed it That was actually, if not the most popular Most downloaded episode of the Stephen R. Ellis podcast, it was one of the most popular episodes. I remember watching when the episode went out for the, you know, for a couple of weeks, downloads just kept boom, boom, boom. I just kept hitting downloads. And I thought to myself, should I just be doing a Conan the Barbarian podcast? And some of you might have just heard me say that and said, yes, that's what we need in our world, Stephen, a Conan the Barbarian podcast. But I can't be doing that. I don't got time for that. I barely got time for this show that I'm doing right here, which is why we put this episode out today. So let me wrap this up. Let me send you off into the world a little more entertained, a little more fulfilled. You're going to get more of these. I hope you enjoy them. I hope you get something out of them. And I hope you keep coming back for more. But until then, my name is Steven, and I'm just another fanboy. Let's be nice to each other, folks. Let's be nice to each other out there, folks. By crom, let's be nice to each other. Just Another Fanboy is a presentation of the Stephen or Else podcast. Questions and comments can be directed to feedback at stephenorelse.com. You can support the show for as little as a dollar a month at patreon.com slash Stephen R. Orr and get instant access to the My Other Podcast podcast, a weekly show about whatever crawls its way into my tiny little mind just moments before I tap record. You can find me on the World Wide Web at stephenorelse.com or find me on Twitter and Instagram by searching for at Stephen or else. I also encourage you to subscribe to the show, leave us a five-star review, and share this episode with a friend. Just Another Fanboy is a proud member of the Comics Podcast Network. You can find that over at comicspodcasts.com. All links will be in the show notes. Good job.